Hey there, I'm Dan, you're watching The Salty Sea, and today we have the beginning of our order section, which is going to be um, near the end of our post Tome of Champions before Warcry 2.0 lists review. Now, for those of you who don't know, there's been a lot of information dropping about Warcry's next expansion, the Heart of Gur, um, going to be like a whole new release schedule, a whole new setting, um, some rules changes. Now, if reactions come out with the box and change list building in a major way, I'll cover that. But for the most part, I would be surprised because it looks like they're going to the, the kill team release schedule, which means a lot of these warbands likely won't be updated uh, right away, which means that I would expect that these lists uh, should be valid for at least the next three months or so. And uh, if not, and if, if things get changed, I'll definitely be covering that. And then, you know, because in that case, these will only be around for another month or two. But let's get into it. I'm going to start with a budget list and then a competitive balance list using the kind of Tome of Champions template. And then another competitive or creative list. Um, it's going to be just like the other list building videos. So I'm going to generally choose sort of solid lists over dysfunctional ones for budget. Whether we get another competitive or creative uh, list is going to really depend on what ways you build the given faction that I'm talking about. And then just for how this video is going to break down, all the non-human factions are going to be here in part one. So all your elves, your dwarves, your dinosaurs are all here. Uh, and then all the humies are going to be in part two. So um, cities of Sigmar, uh, we'll, we'll go for each city a little bit. Um, and then all the Stormcast chambers, all of those, those will be in part two. Um, and then I'm going to actually push the Bespoke Warbands out until we see Heart of Gur, um, because the, the two pieces in there are going to have, you know, a whole new sort of paradigm for list building. I think it'll be really fun to theory craft with that. And then, um, and then we'll have a little bit different structure based on whether or not they push out reactions to uh, to all the bespoke things. So let's, uh, like we do every time, let's talk about the best allies. So if you're playing in an event with allies or if you're just playing with your buddies and you wanna take allies, um, you can do that. And Order has, you know, it's the biggest Grand Alliance. It has the biggest smorgasbord of uh, valid allies to try and take. So. The first one, and the one that I would really suggest for every warband, almost every single warband under the sun should be taking a Tempest Eye um, ally from Cities of Sigmar. So Tempest Eye gives you Swift as the Wind. Um, it's a very powerful movement ability that um, can go on a ton of different heroes. So I would first lean towards the Guard Master for range. Now the Guard Master is the um, Dark Elf, you know, crossbow leader, and is very, very cheap. Um, however, if you want melee, um, the Anointed, the Assassin, and the Fleet Master are all solid. The Fleet Master is a good little cheap option. The Anointed and the Assassin are good, um, slightly more expensive options, but give you a little bit harder hitting power if you're if you're looking to use your leader slots for, um, you know, for a damaging kind of hard piece. Um, the Anointed and the Assassin. They play slightly different roles, the Anointed being a little bit more defensive, um, but they both get their jobs done pretty well. Uh, just so you know, Swift as the, as the Wind reads, until the end of the battle round, add the value of this ability to the move characteristic of friendly fighters within six inches of this fighter when it uses the ability. So you can pop this on um, a leader, get the whole deployment group moving really fast and really fast because... Um, it's the value of the dice. So you could go up to six here and then uh, just run away. And then all the other buddies are still there doing it um, when they <laughs> when it's their turn to activate. So it's incredibly powerful, um, you know, tied with the ones in death and destruction is probably the most powerful ability in the game. However, this one's better than those than what uh, death and destruction can get their hands on because you have such a wide variety of heroes to put it on, um, that for ally purposes, this is much, much stronger than those ones. Um, now the other thing you often ally for is to put in kind of a dragon into your list, something that can fly, do a lot of damage, make the game really revolve around it. And order has a ton of options for this. Um, you've got your prosecutor prime with hammers. You've got your knight of zeros. 
um, your Mizzen Master, your Akelian King. Now, a lot of their best dragons either don't fly, so you have the Evocator Prime on Thundercat with Blade and Stave, or they're not leaders. So, like, the Prosecutor Prime with Grand Blade is actually, in my opinion, a better uh, dragon than the Prosecutor or sorry, not Prosecutor Prime, uh, just regular Prosecutor with Grand Blade, I think is a better dragon than the Prosecutor Prime with Hammers. Um, but either way, you're just spoiled for choice in order to the point where I think most factions, you actually won't ally in a big flyer because you'll already have access to one. Uh, for Disruption, there's also, again, surprise, surprise, because it's order, there's also really good options here. Uh, you have the Bloodrack Medusa, which has that incredible combo of Bloodrack Stare, which is an 88% chance net, and the two inch reach. So basically you can stop someone in their tracks and then the Bloodrack Medusa does an incredible amount of damage. So you can stop someone from moving. They essentially skip their turn if they're not already in combat. And then you can just be wailing on them from two inches away and they, they have no opportunity to fight back. Um, this Soul Render does the same trick, just at a lower points cost and, um, you know, less power, right? But it's still kind of the same trick of um, a net ability plus longer range. I think regular Soul Renders have three inch range and um, the sort of special Underworld Soul Render has a two inch range. Finally, Order also has really good options for Force Multipliers, which a lot of the Grand Alliances don't. Um, one of the best ones is the High Sentinel for Sharp-Eyed Scryhawk. You basically spot something 20 inches away and ev all of your things get plus one attack when attacking that one thing. Great for um, sort of ranged units sort of pumping their damage up because you can spot this from 20 inches away and then your ranged unit, you know, your opponent will get to activate, but even if they do, you can probably get a ranged unit to be able to shoot uh, whatever you've picked out with the Scryhawk. So that's really strong. Also worth noting that Miari from the Underworld's Warband also has this ability, just costs a little more, harder to put in lists, but still good. Um, and then finally, I think the best Karadran Overlord's uh, hero for Fight for Profit is the Gunnery Sergeant. Fight for Profit is really amazing because it's a AOE damage boost that works for ranged units and um, can be two attacks instead of just one attack. So um you if if you're near an objective it's going to be extra attacks and even if you're not you still get plus one attack and that can combo with ranged units really well so oh another thing to worthwhile is uh, the aether chemist is also really solid for uh for using fight for profit so let's start with the daughters of cain um now, getting them on a budget, the Warcry box that they sold, uh, they went on sale about three months ago, but it's still all all over the place online. Um, it comes with a Gorgai. So it comes with um, one set of regular foot troops, whether Witch Elves or Sisters of Slaughter, and then one set of snakes, right? So you can do a Gorgai, a Blood Sister, seven Sisters of Slaughter with Whip and Knife, and a Witch Elf. Um, for the most part, expensive eight wound models did get a little worse with the Tome of Champions. However, I don't think that's true. And by expensive eight wound models, I mean anything that's eight wounds and costs more than 60 points, uh, all of the like 55, 50.8 wound models, um, all of those are still incredible with the Tome of Champions. But most of the ones that uh, cost over 60 points, you kind of prefer to have 10 wounds now. However, that's not true if they've got two inch range. So the Sisters of Slaughter, Plague Monks are like this too. Um, they have that two inch range and that helps keep them really safe while they still do quite a bit of damage. So Sisters of Slaughter, I think are an incredible piece for any of these Daughters of Cain lists. You can see, um, you know, for my competitive list, I've also got them as sort of the core backbone of the Warband. Uh, the Warcry box doesn't have a Bloodrack Medusa, but if I were going to take them competitively, uh, that would be my first get would be to get a Bloodrack Medusa. I'd pair it with the Gorgai. I still would never do two Bloodrack Medusas just because so much of the value there is on that triple ability and you're not gonna do tr two triple abilities in a round. So uh, you'd kind of rather have the better combat stats you get with the Gorgai. Um, then, you know, I've still got two Witch Elves in this competitive list. Um, that's just because that's how the points work out. Funny thing about Witch Elves is at only 65 points and still doing reasonable damage, um, 
a lot of factions would kill to have witch elves as their top chaff, but because you have Sisters of Slaughter, they're really just role players. Um, so here I'm just, I have two here because of fitting the points, but otherwise um, I'm going to be leaning on Sisters of Slaughter with the whip and the knife. Uh, you could test a Shrike for the Gore Guy. The Shrike is the Canari leader. Uh, the Canari in general, uh, the Winged Sisters, they're not very good. However, the leaders have a little bit more health so that you can keep them alive a little bit longer. And the Shrike is special because with 12-inch move and 8-inch shots, that 20-inch threat range is amazing, and it does enough damage to be relevant there. Um, there's a lot of situations where you can move the Shrike onto a piece of terrain that lets you shoot javelins down at everywhere that's relevant because you've still got that eight inch reach. And then um, and then there's nothing your opponent can do to kind of get to the shrike. And that can be really advantageous for you. Um, one last uh, list that I wanted to create. Um, Daughters of Cain are incredibly powerful. So I wanted to do something a little bit kind of out of left field with them for the last list. Um, so I've got this Cobra Kai list, right? Uh, I think Xanthar Kai is the actual name of it. Uh, but a Bloodrack Medusa, a Gorgai, and then three Blood Sisters. Um, the Tome of Champions made it so that you could do Elite Warbands a little bit better. I don't think this is one of the strongest Elite Warbands out there, but I do think it's playable. Um, because, again, the Bloodrack Medusa and Gorgai, that's an incredibly competitive, um, just heavy hitter combo to have as half of your list. Uh, so then three Blood Sisters. Everything here moves seven. Everything here has range two. Everything here has reasonable fighting stats. Um, it's going to be a nightmare for certain opponents who can't efficiently break through that range two barrier uh, to fight back against you. So I think that this is a really powerful list for people who don't like painting up lots of chaff. So overall for the Daughters of Cain, um, competitively they're in an excellent place. Uh, they're actually one of the only ones that I would say is excellent despite not having a big flyer. And the reason for that is it's so easy for them to get to move seven if they want to and have move seven all over the board. So the lack of a flyer doesn't hurt them nearly as much. And then also those Sisters of Slaughter are so good. Um, in casual and narrative play though, I'd say they're only fine, and the reason that I don't love them for casual and narrative play is there's a lot of really cool fi fighters in Daughters of Cain. Okay, that should be a positive, but all I'm saying is that a lot of the really cool things in Daughters of Cain are kind of a trap. Like, you really want to use the, um, the, the Flying Sisters, the Canari, especially because there's only so many you can use in AOS, so it'd be nice to be able to use them in Warcry. Um, so they're a huge trap in Warcry, and I think that's a problem. The other issue is that um, for the basic troops, the Sisters of Slaughter, the Witch Elves, for Sisters of Slaughter, um, the, the variant that everyone builds for Age of Sigmar, the one with the shields, is really bad in Warcry, and the variant that's really good in Warcry, uh, I don't know if it's bad in AOS, I don't know enough about AOS to know if it's bad, bad, but I do know that nobody plays it. Um, and so that that juxtaposition, I mean, they do it on purpose to give you, if you happened to build your models one way, no matter what, you at least have a game system where they're good. They do this all the time. Um, but it can be a little frustrating. Like if you came from Age of Sigmar, you might not have a great time with your Daughters of Cain in Warcry because you might not have the right pieces. Um, so that can be a little bit of an issue for casual play, for narrative play. But if you're, say, just built, like, grabbing the um, the box, I've got one. Unfortunately, it's in the basement, not over there. But I've, I bought the box for them, the Warcry box, um, because it's such a good, such a good value. Um, if you got that, you're going to have a great time with Doc uh, playing in your games um, because, you know, the pieces in that box are excellent. Fire Slayers. Oh, poor Fire Slayers. Okay, so I think the best way to approach Fire Slayers on a budget is to grab the Fire Slayers half of Fury of the Deep. Uh, if you can't find it on eBay, you can definitely just buy Fury of the Deep and sell the Ideneth Deepkin half. Um, and I think that's probably the most cost-effective way to do it. If you do that, you get a Flame Keeper. Um, it gives... Um, more attacks once something has died or sorry it doesn't give more attacks it gives plus one damage to regular hits and crits uh once an ally has or like a you know friendly model has died 
Um, so Volkites with two weapons have four attacks. They get the biggest buff out of it. So I would go with a Flamekeeper, a Hearthguard Berserker with Broadaxe, six Volkites. You really want to have a lot of them. And then two Auric Hearthguard. And I would say that's your, that's your force. You've got 10 fighters. That's all right. Um, you're getting a pretty big damage buff on those Volkites. You just have to be careful because a lot of the time um, with your positioning, if your opponent, you know, if, if it only procs when you get a, when your opponent gets a kill, sometimes, you know, depending on where that kill is, you might not have the big team fight anymore that you wanted to, you, you know, cause you can't just pop it at the beginning of a round. Um, so that can be a little bit of a disadvantage, but sometimes, um, it's good because it changes how your opponent plays. Uh, I, not going to tell you that this is a powerful list. However, I do think it'll be kind of a, a coherent list for any of your casual games. Um, if you're going to be kind of quote unquote competitive with fire slayers, uh, the, the two leaders that I think are sort of most respectable and they're not respectable. All the fire slayers have this problem of three inch move. Um, the two leaders that I think kind of have respectable combat stats are the Auric rune father and the Volkite berserker, Carl. So I would include those two as your heavy hitters and then just load up on Volkites with two weapons, just move three. It's so hard to cover the board. The best way to mitigate it is to just have a lot of fighters covering because then just like by quantity, they cover more of the board. You know what I mean? So move three is less of a big deal on chaff than it is on expensive things. Um, so with fire slayers, I would just go all in on their cheapest unit. Uh, and then I would have one Hearthguard Berserker with a broad axe. This is for sort of Tome of Champions considerations where you do want to have at least one respectable fighter in every deployment group. The Hearthguard Berserker is sort of, that's only debatably true about the Berserker, but um, it does sort of hold, hold up in a fight. It definitely uh, beats up on chaff models at least. Um, another thing I would want to try, because even this competitive list for Fire Slayers, I would say, is going to work fine in casual games, but not actually be tournament competitive. Um, so I think if you're going with Fire Slayers, I think it behooves you to get a little desperate. Try out some weird stuff. I would go with Threat Range Berserkers, is what I'm calling this. So you'd go with two Grimwrath Berserkers. They're not the most points efficient, but they have a really interesting quad. Um, basically, it adds the dice to the movement for a Rampage. So normally Rampage on Fire Slayers isn't that great because the movement you get for Rampage is only because it's bonus move, then a bonus attack, right? And the bonus move you get is only three inches and that can be pretty rough. Um, however, with this quad, you could get, you know, on average three and a half inches, right? So your extra movement with the quad is going to be a pretty significant movement, which means anytime you roll a quad um, or roll a triple and add upgrade to a quad, so 37% of rounds, uh, you're going to have a much more impactful rampage than Fire Slayers are capable of normally. And I think that that's kind of, I hate building around quads, but I think in this case, that's worth building around. Uh, then I would have one Volkite for, you know, every deployment group um, to have a chaff model boost up your numbers. And then I would go with Auric Hearthguard. Hearthguard got in my opinion, a really undeserving nerf in the Tome of Champions, but they're still important for Fire Slayers because you just need to boost your threat range as much as possible. And Hearthguard at least have that 15 inch range. They do a little bit of damage, but then more importantly, they um, have that ability where they can reduce the movement on your opponent to make your opponent just as slow as you are. And uh, that can help you a lot. I think uh, I would like you know, if we're talking about things I wish Fire Slayers could do, uh, it's either move faster, which this quad does, or if uh, if Hearthguard could be even more efficient at making your opponents slower and bringing them down to Fire Slayers level, um, you know, I wish that that was possible. Because overall, Fire Slayers are probably the worst faction in the game competitively. Um, it's between them and Iron Golems. Uh, it's really close as to which is worse. I think Fire Slayers is worse than Iron Golems. I'm not, you know, I'm not 100% confident there. They do have some more options than IG does. So it could be close, but um, those are the bottom two for sure. For casual and narrative play, um, one cool thing about Fire Slayers is they have a lot of different heroes. I value that really highly for narrative play because it 
it lets you tell your own story with more options. Um, the issue is this is the one, well, one of only two factions in the game where I think that they are so weak competitively that it will be frustrating in your casual games. You can take the most competitive Fire Slayers uh, force and you're still going to struggle against a Daughters of Cain force where someone just, you know, like this budget Daughters of Cain force, someone got the cheapest dock force they could find and they're still just crushing you with your Fire Slayers. Um, so that can be a little bit frustrating. If you don't mind losing a lot, Fire Slayers are going to be really fun. Um, but this is one where the competitive issues can can cause casual problems too. On to Ideneth Deepkin. Uh, not an army with competitive issues. Uh, Budget-wise, you could just get Fury of the Deep um, and sell the Fire Slayers half. That's totally valid. The other way to do it is to uh, get Elethane's Soul Raid and a box of eels. Uh, that would come out to $97 pre-discounts. Um, cool thing about it, you know, the whole soul raid, other than Dune Claw, uh, Dune Claw being the crab that everyone loves, the whole soul raid is pretty solid um, as fighters. Elethane has a really sweet net ability. Um, and then two Ishlan Guard is just a great addition to just about any Ideneth Deepkin warband, right? Um, Ishlan Guard are fast, they're hard to kill for their points, they do respectable damage, they fly 10 inches. Um, they're just an excellent piece to have in, in any Ideneth army. Um, so I think that this would be a very functional list. Um, Tamail is a really solid piece. Fuiran is really cool in that he's like 1.5 Thralls. Um, and Thralls are good, but they're very killable. So having one that's just kind of bigger and harder to kill uh, isn't bad for a mid-range fighter. Um, so I think this is a really solid, solid piece. The other way you could go is you could get a box of thralls instead of the eels, um, and that would give you a really nice swarm warband. Um, you know, thralls got a little bit worse with the Tome of Champions, uh, but they're still good because they do so much damage for their points that even though eight wounds not really, not as good as it used to be, um, it's still very good, and there's still some. The eight wound fighters that were amazing before are still good now, um, and thralls were amazing. Um, so if I were going to go with sort of competitive Ideneth Deepkin, I would start with an Achillean King. Um, that two inch range is really good, um, especially now with four rounds where staying alive matters more, uh, which is why I would also have the Soul Render, who, a lot like Elethane basically, has that net ability plus an extra inch of range. Um, to get damage in while locking down an opposing fighter. And then an Ishlian Guard just to have another heavy hitter in another deployment group that flies. And then three Thralls and Fuiran. Um, Fuiran being kind of 1.5 Thralls and um, being really solid that way. Uh, I think this would be a really strong list. Um, I know, you know, the returns on people who have played with Achillean Kings are incredible. Ishlian Guard were obviously a pretty big competitive mainstay before the Tome of Champions, and they got better, honestly. The TOC really, really favors um, exactly what Ishlan Guard do well. So uh, this would be a great start for any kind of person who loves the fish and wants to get competitive in Warcry. Uh, another option, though, which I also think is actually pretty competitive, is this Sea Monsters list. Now, um, ever since Justin showed us the power of just like four heavy hitters that are very fast, um, people have been trying to kind of theorize what other factions could do the same thing. And I really think the only ones that I really love, that I've seen so far that I love, um, are, there's a few. I mean, Beasts of Chaos can do it. Um, Zinch can almost sort of do it. And, uh, same with, um, I don't love the way, like, Karadron Overlords or uh, Stormcast Warriors do it, but I do love the way Ideneth Deepkin does it, because one of the things that made that Thundercats list so powerful is it wasn't just that they were fast and could put out damage. Uh, point for point, Thundercats are only, like, decent at putting out damage, but what made them so amazing was they were incredibly fast and practically unkillable, which for four rounds instead of three was really valuable. 
Well, Achillean kings are practically unkillable. They've got the two-inch range, tons of wounds. They put out great damage. Um, and then Ishlan Guard are really solid too. So you can have two Achillean kings and two Ishlan Guard. Um, Storm of Blows is sort of the the damage output spell that Achillean kings can cast on themselves. Uh, Biovoltaic Barrier is a really solid defensive ability. So you have one of the problems that a lot of factions have when they go down to only four fighters is uh, they, they're not giving themselves interesting abilities to work with and uh, they're kind of handicapping themselves on the dice mechanic. Not true for the sea monsters. The sea monsters are absolutely making the most of their ability dice every turn and um, that's going to be really powerful. If you are someone who likes to play with very few models and you want to still have a fighting chance, I think the sea monsters list is for you. Um, I could go on and on though with like very playable, either kind of low tournament tier or very high casual tier Ideneth Deepkin play styles. Um, you used to be able to do Reaver Gunline, uh, but the Toma Champions nerfed it. You can still do it in casual play though even if it maybe doesn't have as many competitive legs as it used to. Uh, you can th flood the board with thralls. You can do double king plus chaff. You can do the soul render plus soul scryer control combo. Um, there's just a ton of things that you can do with Ideneth Deepkin. Honestly, just one of the best factions in the game for both competitive play and narrative play. Competitive, they're excellent, but there are factions that are a little bit better than them competitively. But they're still in that A tier where you can absolutely win a tournament with them uh, if you play well. But casually and in narrative play, man, they're, they've got to be in the top three or four in the whole game. I mean, like, they're there with Gloomspite Gits as just, like, just being head and shoulders above most most of these factions in the game in terms of the incredible options that you have with them and the fact that all the options are playable. That's something I value quite a bit is not just do you have options, but do, are your options actually going to be fun in game? And all of them work pretty well. So um, Idnet Deepkin, just a perfectly designed faction in my opinion. They're competitive, they're casual, pretty high for both. KO. KO are a really interesting one. So on a budget, I would get a box of Arco, and then the Balloon Boys are really cheap on eBay because they've been a part of so many value sets. Uh, so I would do that, and uh, I actually have this list, and I'm looking forward to running it. So uh, you know that I do believe in this list. I actually painted it very recently. Um, this is how I'm going to run it. Uh, a Sky Warden Custodian, a Sky Warden with Volley Gun, um, an Arco with Volley Gun. I would say either like find some sticky tack or a magnet or just people who don't mind. The only difference between a Sky Warden and an Endron Rigger is this like little group of floating grenades that goes on the balloon. That's it. Um, anyway, so then an Arco with Volley Gun, an Arco with Sky Pike, and then five basic ones. Um, this is going to be a really solid sort of gun line adjacent type of list. Um, Actually, there's only two non-shooters in this list. It's a gunline list. Um, really solid little list. I know there were some small nerfs here from the Tome of Champions. Um, to be honest, KO kind of needed it in casual play, uh, but it's still going to be very playable. If I was going for competitive play with Caradron Overlords, uh, I would start with Flyers and Guns. Um, that's kind of going along what was generally successful in the Tome of Champions sort of uh, Adepticon tournaments. Um, an Endrin Rigger Mizzen Master is a really good flying combat piece. Uh, then you could have an Endrin Rigger with Volley Gun um, for just a mobile gun platform. Volley Guns are still under costed in terms of their point for point damage. They're really incredible. Um, then you could have the Thunderer with the Grunstock Mortar. Uh, Thunderers are nice because they have a free disengage, and anything that gives you free actions in this game is good. Um, the disengage obviously is very situational, but it's a situation that if it never comes up, it's probably because you're winning, because that means they're never getting into engage range on your Thunderer. And then if it does come up, it's probably because you were in trouble and you needed help. And that's exactly when you want your abilities to be happening. Um, so the free disengage on Thunderers is really good. Um, so I would say that that Thunderer counts as your third threat and kind of the three threat uh, paradigm over there. And then if you want, you can go all in on comboing with Thunderers. So the Grunstock Mortar doesn't have a lot of attacks, but each attack does good damage. 
That's even more true with the Aether Cannon. On its own, I think the Aether Cannon is really bad because you whiff a lot. But if you are playing Fight for Profit with a Gunnery Sergeant and an Aether Chemist to kind of go around the board, so you would split one with your Grunstock Mortar, one with your Aether Cannon, and then you would just fill it out with four Arcanauts. Um, the damage you get out of an Aether Cannon with Fight for Profit on when it's standing on a... Um, sorry, an objective, is absurd. It is absurd. You can blow anything off the board that you want with it. Um, you can sometimes just get 30 damage just like off of two shots with your Aether Cannon that are fighting for profit, uh, which is enough to blow off, off the board, like even really big heroes. Um, so obviously there are going to be missions where your mobility is too much of an issue and you just lose because of that. But it's going to happen less than you would think because, you know, you still have power projection even though you don't have mobility. Um, so this is a really scary list and, man, does it blow just like unprepared lists just right out of the water. Um, I think you're going to have problems with dragons, for example, but for the most part, I think that this list is going to be really difficult to play against and uh, might be a lot of fun to try out. Competitively... Uh, KO, they're not in the very top of the metagame, but they are very good. They're, like, right below it. Um, you know, if, if, uh, the Warcry metagame is, like, spiders and then a list of, like, maybe six to eight factions right below spiders that would have a really interesting metagame, um, if spiders didn't exist. KO are in that, like, next group right below them that can definitely beat any of the top factions on any given day, um, depending on what's going well. Um... So I think they're very good. Casually and in narrative play, I'm only going to say fine. They have a lot of what I value, which is like multiple different options for troops, um, leaders that have functional abilities. Uh, the issue is that it can be kind of hard to create a KO list that is fun to play against for someone who's not bringing something competitive. Um, KO, a lot of the times... The game's decided really early. When you win, you look unbeatable, and when you lose, you look non-functional. Um, and that's not a great place to be in casual play. Casual play is more fun when the games are close. Um, and KO play a lot of very not close games. So even when, you know, even when it's in your favor, it feels amazing, but there's also ones that are a disaster the other way. So um, I would say Casually, I'm not sure I love KO as a choice. Um, if you were getting into Warcry not having played AOS, I would only play KO if you love the aesthetic or if you really like the idea of playing um, playing kill team in Warcry. Because that's essentially what Karadron Overlords do is um, they play kill team, basically, while everyone else is playing regular Warcry. And that makes them like a really interesting off-meta choice in competitive play um, because they can absolutely, they are good enough to win a tournament. Uh, so they feed a certain play style. I think they're excellent for competitive play and the competitive scene that way. Um, but for casual play, I, I think it's a little more difficult. Uh, Lumineth Realm Lords, though, I think are really interesting for both. Uh, Budget-wise, finally we have a budget option, which is the Warcry box. Uh, I would go with a High Sentinel. A true stone seneschal which only moves three inches but is just an incredible um damage piece you know combat piece once it gets there and then i would have uh <clears throat> um four venari wardens and two sentinels to just kind of maximize your threat range when the stone guard aren't in play stone guard are really solid combat pieces actually just very very solid combat pieces um, but they only move three, right? So it's going to be tough to get them into position. You're going to have, you're going to want to have one in every deployment group so that you're at least spreading out the board with them. <clears throat> and all of your fast fighters can engage the opponent early while your stone guard, um, get in there late. Uh, as far as playing to the Toma Champions template, I would start with a Venari Lord Regent. That's the uh, one on the very fancy, not a horse. And then I would still have a High Sentinel. High Sentinels are really amazing for their damage buffs. Uh, then I'd have a Dawn Rider. Um, not very excited about their cavalry options. You could do this or a Wind Charger. It's really just to have something flying around the board. 
Uh, and then I would go with three Blade Lords and three Wardens. Blade Lords are really solid uh, point for point efficiency wise. Even if they're kind of stuck in that middle ground, 95 points isn't really a place you want to be. Um, but they're fine. They're, they're really solid, especially for casual play. And they're just good enough to get into um, competitive play too, I think. And then the Wardens with their three inch range is pretty nice. Uh, for a combo list that you could try with Lumineth Realm Lords, um, you could go with double Scryhawk to really boost the attacks um, way into the stratosphere for things. So you could have a high Sentinel and then Mayari Lightcaller with uh, four Sentinels for the shooting. Um, this is so that the high Sentinel and Lightcaller, um, they make each of your Sentinels into just really incredible threats. Um, and then you would round it out with two Blade Lords and three Wardens. Um, Scryhawk and then Shining Company, which is the uh, warrior ability for Lumineth. They're both on doubles, so they don't really fight for space there, which is really nice. Um, so this is going to be just a really solid um, list for sort of any kind of hunter mission. And you have the numbers to play objectives too if you end up in a mission like that. Um, overall, I just think Lumineth Realm Lords... So competitively, I think they're average. Um, they don't have a big flyer. They don't have kind of uh, really cheap chaff. So they're kind of squeezed on both ends of the spectrum there. But for casual and narrative play, I think they're incredible. Um, almost every leader has sort of um, a functional plan on the battlefield. So you can do tons of different things with them. And they have a bunch of different troop choices, um, all of which are pretty solid. So like I would say Blade Lords are their best troop. Um, but Wardens are not a lot worse than them. Um, they give a ton of different options than Blade Lords. They play completely differently than Blade Lords do. And then Stone Guard are really interesting, especially if you put in a Tempest Eye uh, ally in there. So you just have a world of options with Lumineth um, that I think just makes them a really wonderful sort of faction to get into for casual play. Uh, just know that competitively, um, because you're sort of elite but not with monsters, um, you are kind of being squeezed out so that even though everything is designed really well, I think Lumineth honestly is, if not the best designed faction in the game, like certainly one of the best designed faction in the games, um, competitively they're just not up there. But that's okay, right? Because you're still going to have a lot of fun with them. Now onto the dinosaurs. Uh, I think the best budget way to do dinosaurs is with a start collecting skinks box. Um, it's $110, but I'm putting kind of quotes around that because a lot of the value of the box is wrapped up in the Bastilladon that's in there. And you don't need a Bastilladon for Warcry. So if you're only interested in Warcry, you can uh, sell the Bastilladon pretty easily and recoup a huge percentage of the box cost for that. So this is actually one of the cheapest warbands in the game. Um, I would go with a Skink Chief Pterodon. Um, that's kind of the one with the melee weapon. And then a Ripperdactyl and a Pterodon Rider. Uh, that's now with the Bolas. And then four Skinks with Blowpipes and then two Skinks with Clubs and Shields. So um, nine fighters, but you've got three sort of very fast flyers, um, two of which are reasonably hard to kill. And then the Pterodon Rider with the Bolas has that ability to kind of perch on terrain and hit people, or it has the ability to kind of just have itself fighting, but staying safe. Um, the uh, the ability on it is also pretty interesting. Um, so you just have a lot of options with this. And then Skinks with Blowpipes, man. So before the nerf, obviously they were one of the best chaff fighters in the game. Um, even with the nerf, they're still solid though. 75 points for what you're getting off Skinks is pretty reasonable, especially with those four damage crits. I mean, that's what you're really running them for. Um, I did play a, uh, a high skink volume list after the Tome of Champions to see how much the nerf hurt them. Um, they ended up losing due to a really unlucky roll in round four. Um, otherwise, they would have won. So there's, and that was that was against a very Blood Reaver heavy corn uh, list. So a very reasonable sort of high middle tier um, warband. So there's still a lot of sort of gas in the tank, um, juice in the cup, whatever you want to call it. There's still a lot of it for Seraphon uh, with Skinks. However, um, what I would try for the Tome of Champions if I were playing them is something that was sort of 
you weren't seeing it in a lot of lists um, because it was just like one step less efficient than the skinks with blowpipes. But then when the blowpipes got nerfed, all of a sudden salamanders became a lot more interesting. So I would go with a pterodon chief and a pterodon rider alpha. Um, that's sort of two big, you know, flyers that are going around the board doing pretty powerful things for you. And then for my other deployment group in the dagger, I would have a salamander with two skink handlers. Skink handlers are only 45 points. Um, they're something that you can absolutely flood the board with. I don't have any sort of skink handler board flood lists here, but it's absolutely something that you can do that is powerful. But I'm really interested in the way they can supercharge a salamander. This is something that was really solid before, but just not quite on the level of doing it with just skink gunline. Now that skinks have been nerfed, I would really investigate the salamander combos um, pretty heavily with Seraphon. I think that that's probably the way to go. Um, it might be wise to do even more skink handlers than what I've got here, but what I've got instead I think I like too, which is Otapodle, which is the chameleon skink from the Underworld's Warband, is just much more efficient than skinks with blowpipes um, in terms of its damage output at range. And I think I value that quite a bit. I think it's going to be even more efficient than the salamander getting pumped by the skinks. Um, you know, if you could spam Otapodles, you absolutely would try it. Uh, but for now, I would just, I would give this a try uh, if you have access to the Underworld's Warband. Um, if not, you could drop Otapodle and the Skink with Club and Shield and just go with three more Skink Handlers. Um, another thing I'd want to try, because I think that Underworld's Warband in general is really solid and worth trying out. If you wanted to do something with a lot of beat sticks, because um, I know some people, uh, shout out to Dayton Warcry Club. I know that they tried out Clack Troc and really liked it. Um, I'll uh, link to their channel down below. Maybe I'll try to find the battle report where they fight with Skinks or fight with Seraphon. Um, but they really liked Clacktrock, and um, I would. They uh, they've been kind of messing around with an Eternity Warden, which is a really interesting sort of damage per point piece that I still don't really like in general. Um, I would encourage you to try out a Saurus Guard Leader with the Underworld's Warbands. Uh, they are really hard to kill for their points, and they've got the two-inch range. So they're this really good defensive stalwart that you can put into the middle of the board. And then with two-inch range, it can threaten a really wide area, which I think is really valuable. Um, then, of course, having Otapodle, another blowpipe skink, and then uh, Zepic, which is the 65-point uh, upgrade to a skink with club and shield. It's got two more wounds than a regular melee skink, which on these tiny little skinkers is actually really, really valuable. If you could spam Zepix, Zepic, I don't exactly know how the pronunciation is, but if you could spam them, you absolutely would. Um, and then of course, I've got a Salamander with three skink handlers here because I just, I think that combo is the bee's knees right now. Um, there's also, this is kind of a perfect fit for a Slon here if you have things you wanna cut um, for Kixitaka the Diviner, um, a Slon being able to teleport its friends around is really, really valuable. So I would give that a try. Um, I think that this Underworld's Warband is a really promising start if you don't feel like you need flyers in your list. So overall, I would say Seraphon are in a good place competitively, maybe even a very good place. Um, We've seen a few people try them to kind of certain degrees of success in tournaments. Um, I think they've still got a lot of a lot of play there, but I don't think they're right at the top anymore. Um, I think that the blowpipe nerf definitely knocked them down a peg, um, but they're still very, very playable. Uh, for casual and narrative play, though, I would say they're amazing. Uh, really great because all of the options do something, you know? Um, you can go with Saurus and have a ton of fun there. Um, Saurus Knights are a lot better in the Tome of Champions than they used to be. Now they've still got that uh, mount problem, but the four rounds really helps the style of play that Knights have. Um, so something like the um, the leader that's on a Saurus or on a cold one is something that's worth considering. And that didn't even make it into you know these lists here. Um, so you just have a lot of options that you can really try out. Uh, the only 
The only sad one is the Croxigore. Uh, poor Croxigores are uh, totally ruined now, um, but that's fine. Otherwise, uh, Seraphon are really great. Finally, we get to Sylvaneth. Um, on a budget, Yotharia's Guardians are only $27 right now because uh, you don't need to buy them with the cards, and they're really solid. Uh, Scathiel is just an incredible amount of damage output and actually a pretty reasonable defensive profile too. Um, and then uh, Galangan of the Glade isn't that great, but Anslane is great because it's it's an archer. Um, overall, the two Underworlds Warbands, adding three archers into the mix for Sylvaneth was really valuable. And then I would pair that box with a box of Kurnoths. Um, I would just have one of each of the non-leaders here. Uh, Scathiel and then all the Kurnoths are just really good combat pieces, and I think you can get really far with this, uh, with this Underworlds Warband. Um, if you're going competitive, I would start by taking... Um, the Adepticon winning list. Oh, did I mention, by the way, Sylvaneth won Adepticon. Um, I would start by taking the winning list from Adepticon. Um, an Arch Revenant, a Kurnoth Hunter with Scythe, Scathe the Huntsman, a Tree Revenant in every deployment group, and then some of the um, spicier sort of new chaff from Scathe's Wild Hunt. I think most people will get more out of having a Kurnoth Hunter in the Scathe role. Than, um, than having Scathe there, just because Scathe is a very hard piece to use competitively. I think it really requires a lot of mastery of the game to be able to get the most out of Scathe. So I would suggest flipping Scathe for a Kurnoth Hunter at first, but um, certainly keep Scathe around if you, if you want to try out what Kyle was doing with it. Um, this list, you know, obviously it won the tournament for a reason. It sort of established the paradigm of having a real threat in every deployment group but then the other thing that makes it so valuable is the tree revenants can teleport uh, just like they do in aos basically and that ability just wins games um having a tree revenant is just so valuable in sylvaneth i would never leave home without at least one of them um just because that ability is so good and so kyle chose to have one in every deployment group which i think is a great approach to building with them um, but if you wanted to, you could try out the new incredibly efficient chaff that they've given us with the Underworlds Warbands and just go all in on that and only have one tree, tree revenant. So I've got here what I call a super chaff list. Um, I think the Kurnoth Huntmaster with Scythe is really amazing. It's um, sort of a supercharged version of a regular Kurnoth with Scythe. Uh, four inch movement is usually a bit of a liability on really expensive pieces because you want to deliver your power quickly but the two inch reach really helps mitigate that and the amount of damage that the Huntmaster puts out is really incredible and the way it can just control a huge piece of the board is really wonderful oftentimes when i play with it um, i find that i just spend the first round moving it into position and then you know, at least two of the subsequent rounds, I find that it's getting to do a double attack because there's almost always stuff within range. Um, then I would go with Carthane. That's the uh, the one with the horn that gives extra attacks. I would go with Shiok, which is just a really solid damage output piece. Um, Althane, and then Lighane. Um, Althane's the, the shooter. Um, Lighane is the cat. Uh, you could go with a Spite Revenant there instead. Um, but what I like about them is they all move five or eight for the cat, which um, is just really nice for your chaff to be able to be running around the board. And they're all just so much more efficient than dryads were um, in terms of like actual combat powers, which I think is valuable. I think it's really valuable to have your chaff be um, actually contributing to the overall fights in the game, as opposed to just kind of being there to go grab the gold until they get killed. Uh, then I would have Scathael and Anslane. That's the Archer and the um, the really high damage Tree Revenant from Yulthari's Guardians. I think those are uh, really solid chaff pieces as well. Kind of 85 points leaning on the expensive side to actually call it chaff. It's more like a elite chaff or just like a really cheap regular fighter. Um, basically, Scathiel and 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 like Anslane and Carthane and Althane, you know, all these 80 point Underworlds models for Sylvaneth, they all do what mid-range fighters are supposed to do, um, but at a points cost that you can actually play. 
Um, so I think that they're really strong. And then, of course, I would have a Tree Revenant. I would never leave home with Sylvaneth without a Tree Revenant. They're just amazing. That ability is ridiculous. Uh, so that's how I would go with Sylvaneth now if I had all the pieces. I don't have all the pieces. I do have Skase Wild Hunt now, though. So I am going to be trying out Kyle's Adepticon list at some point, um, And I'm pretty excited to do so. Overall, competitively, Sylvaneth are great. Um, they have everything you want, right? They have heavy hitting titans, they have a flyer, they have really um, solid chaff with actual utility to it, right? As opposed to just chaff that's there to be bodies. Um, they've, yeah, they've got everything you want for a competitive list, and I think uh, Sylvaneth are really solid. Uh, it was, it's been really wonderful for uh, Warcry while Sylvaneth were terrible in AOS. Uh, for Sylvaneth to be really good in Warcry, to give, you know, tree lovers something to uh, something to go with. I remember when I posted the tournament recap um, of Sylvaneth winning Adepticon, uh, that was like one of the main things that people were talking about was how excited they were that Beasts of Chaos and Sylvaneth and Gloomspite gets three of the absolute worst armies in AOS at the time were all dominating Warcry. Uh, that made people really excited, and I love that for them. Um, Sylvaneth now, <laughs> of course, uh, being pretty solid in AOS, that's less of a need, but it's still cool. Um, casually and in narrative play, I think Sylvaneth are great too. I think these Underworlds Warbands add a whole bunch to it. Um, and there's also different play styles you can go with. Uh, dryads really try to tempt you to go the all Dryad list. Um, it's a bit of a trap, but Dryads aren't garbage. I mean, they still move five. They have a surprising amount of damage to them, um, especially with that ability. So Dryads are pretty good too. So kind of all the pieces of Sylvaneth work pretty great. And one thing that's cool about Dryads is you can choose to just have a bunch of Dryads all in one deployment group and have your other two deployment groups be other stuff. And that can be a really fun time too. So overall, Sylvaneth, I think, are one of the better designed teams in Warcry. Um, I think they're wonderful. I think it's sad that it's sounding like we likely won't get any Sylvaneth for um, the sort of... I was hoping for a bespoke Sylvaneth warband for Warcry 2.0. We likely won't get that. Um, and that's too bad because they would fit perfectly in the setting. But uh, either way, I, you know, there's so much to play with right now for Sylvaneth that uh, there's really no worries there. I've got to thank my patrons for this. Um, again, they encouraged me to get back on the horse with this list, um, this kind of list series video. I'm really thankful that they did. And there's a lot of news for Warcry going forward. I'll be covering this um, in a video either this weekend or early next week. But uh, we're learning that the future for Warcry is incredibly bright. And I would not be able to cover it if it weren't for them. Um, as far as like a lot of the new products that are coming out, I just wouldn't be able to keep up with the game anymore. Um, the list, the, um, the, uh, the release schedule is going to be really fast and thick. If you haven't heard, we're going to be getting a new release every three months. Um, I'll be making a video to just kind of unpack what that means along with reactions. Um, but it would just be impossible to follow the game as sort of a, a part-time content creator if it weren't for um, my patrons helping out. So I'm just so incredibly thankful to them. Um, and if you feel like supporting these kind of videos or if you feel like kind of having a say in how I cover the game uh, in the future, please consider signing up and joining the, joining the community there. Um, I'd love to have you. So uh, I'll be back with more videos covering the new edition of Warcry and list building. Um, all of that will be coming in the future. And until then, may all your roles be crits.